to present you uh, Vojta Gina from Google, working on Angular JS, and uh, I wanted to, I really wanted uh, this talk uh, at Wakande because uh, there were some messages on the forum saying, "Oh, there is a new framework called Angular. It looks very powerful. It's nice. Uh, do you think it could work with Wakanda?" So some of them had a look, and uh, yeah, definitely it should be uh, at least working. We have a REST API. We could work maybe with that, and we, we should try. So uh, I contacted uh, very recently uh, Vojta and said, "Yeah, we can try. We can try." And we, we did some tests and. I think it will explain you uh, uh, what is Angular first, because a lot of you may not know about it, and all the power where, uh, Angular can provide for JavaScript applications, like Wakanda ones. And, uh, and then I really want to thank you for being there and presenting it to, to all of us. Thank you. Brilliant. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Alex. So yeah, my name is Vojta and I work in, on this thing called AngularJS and therefore today we're going to talk a little bit about building web apps and especially Angular is pretty much the client side, right? So that's what runs in the browser. It's server-side agnostic but it turns out that it works really well for Wakanda. So last past year, year and a half, my life has been just programming in Angular because we literally spend nights and days working on this thing. And it was just recently I asked myself a question, why? Why am I doing this? And I actually think it's it's really important question. So I would like I would like to share this with you. Because I, I don't think I don't think it's about the Angular the framework or about this about the code that we wrote. I think it's more about what we believe in. Right, we we think we think that building web apps is too difficult, too hard. Like all the all these things, like uh, all the inconsistencies between different browsers, DOM manipulations, event listeners, and all these things just make it too complicated. So we are trying to make it easier, make it easier for you, so that you can implement and realize your great ideas without uh, spending and wasting a lot of time by writing a lot of boilerplate code. And I really believe that. If you want to make it simple, you need, to, you need to think about users first. And for us, users are you developers, right? And that's, that's really important because very often people, people tend to design things based on what is easier to implement or which, implement, which implementation is nicer. You know, I, I've, I've done this mistake so many times, but it just doesn't work. And this is something that my colleague Mishko taught me. Because he always tries to imagine like the, the ideal API, and then we kind of play with it. You know, we spend some time basically using this imaginary ideal API, and once we are happy with it, we just just implement it. I mean, very often there are, there's a lot of issues to overcome, but the point is that you start with imagining some ideal world, and then you implement it, not the other way around. Another thing is testing. You know, at Google, we, we believe in testing a lot. And on Angular team, it's even worse. Like, we're crazy about testing. We, like, every feature in Angular has been designed with testability in mind, so it's easy to test, you know. And that's not just so it's easy for us to test Angular, but it's designed so it's easy for you to test your code. Because you can't just say, you, you can't just take library or framework and say, um, let's make it testable now. Yeah, that doesn't work. You need to think about this since the very beginning. And so we are trying to deliver a solution or framework that, that has testability story baked in like, since the very first time so that everyone can, like, everyone can benefit and rely on testing in the same way as we do. All right. So now I would I would like to I would like to show you some of the core features of Angular, and I hope that you will you will find some of these ideas that we believe in. I hope you will see them in the framework itself. And please ask questions. I've got some stickers and T-shirts for good questions, so that's a motivation. 
All right, first thing I want to talk about is two-way data binding. Why should you care about two-way data binding? Well, it can help you a lot. It can save you from a lot of typing because most of the stuff like DOM manipulation, event listeners, and these things is gone with two-way data binding. Plus, the way how Angular does binding is really declarative. So I think it's way easier to read and understand the templates, and both the templates and the logic, because the logic is agnostic of the view. So then it's easier to see the code and say, ah, yeah, that's what it does. And last thing, my favorite, and again, that's because of the strict separation of view and logic. It's easier to test. Well, so I think, I think we should just do demo. Let's, let's see data binding in action. So I have this uh, simple example, simple app. It's a to-do app. Very creative, I know. Everyone does to-do app, but it actually turns out that Angular is really good at doing to-do apps, so we do it all the time. And what I basically have at this point is just a static HTML. This I Is the font size good enough? Can you see it? No, I don't want to update. <laughs> Thank you. So on, my r on the right side, this is a s static HTML, nothing special. And on the left side, it's just running the static HTML inside browser. And what, what I would like to start with is basically generating, at this point, I've got these two, oops, these two uh, tasks hard-coded in HTML. So I want to start with generating these tasks based on uh, some model in JavaScript, right? So I'm going to start with something called ng-controller. And I'm going to put ng-controller to do uh, on a body element. And that basically tells Angular that this whole body element is being controlled by to-do controller. So let's define to-do controller. This is a JavaScript source file. The only thing that is here at this point is just one line where we create Angular module. It's in Angular, we group everything into modules. And I define this controller. And this control, this is just a constructor and function for the controller. And it, it asks for one argument, which is scope. And that's, that's actually, I think that's kind of important concept in Angular. So because the scope, that's basically the, the synchronization layer. That, that's the interface between, between the view, which is DOM, and the model, which is this JavaScript object. So you can think of it as these two layers, where the view is DOM, and below the DOM, there is this JavaScript structure. It's pretty much plain old JavaScript object. That's this scope. You can call it view model, if you like. And the point is that your application only talks to the scope, to the data model below. So you read from a scope and you write to scope. And the synchronization between these two, that, that happens automatically by two-way data binding. So in this case, I'm just going to put the property items on, on the scope with two items, triangular visit party. And I go to template. I will remove these two guys. So now you can see that if I update it, it's, it's empty. There is nothing. And I'm going to generate them. I'm going to use uh, ng repeat. And I'm going to tell repeat this item for all items. right? And this items, this thing is basically the property that we just defined because the DOM is bound to the scope that is below the, the, the DOM. And let's print the text. So we bind to item text. And now if I refresh, there you go. We generate the list without touching a DOM. And what's even better, and I can, I can, sh I can demonstrate that on, on actually on, on the adding form, is that whenever you change the model, it will automatically synchronize. It will automatically update. So let's, let's implement this adding form so that we can add new, new tasks, because at this point, it's just dead form. So here's our button. And again, w in Angular, it's declarative. So we just specify the behavior. We say, when you click this button, execute function add. And this function, again, is defined on the scope below. 
So we go to our controller and we will define this add method. And because the scope items is just plain JavaScript array, we can just push into this array, right? I'm creating a new object with property text, and I'm pushing this object into the items array. Now I need the value from the input. So instead of traversing the dome, finding the input, and getting the value from the input, I can again rely on binding. So I rather go to my input and I say, I use ng model, oops, say new text. And this tells Angular that this input should be synchronized with the property new text on the scope that is below. And this is already an example of two way data binding because not only that Angular updates uh, the input whenever you change the value in your application, but whenever user types change the value in the input, it will update the model as well, right? So it, it works both ways. And now we can take advantage of this inside the add method because we can say scope um, new text. And if I save this and I try to add a new, new task, we have a new task, right? Without touching a dome. We probably want to clear the input as well, right? So again, instead of finding the input and changing the value, we change the value on the scope into empty string, and it will get updated. So let's do new task, and there you go. The main point is separation, view, and model, right? So if you look, I, for instance, I implemented the same thing with jQuery. And this is a, you might complain that it's possible to write it in a different way. And yes, it is. But this is pretty much what I see all the time on the projects, which is, it's good, it works. But if you ask me to understand this, it, it, you know, I will understand it, but it's just, it takes me some time because the logic is mixed together with a lot of DOM manipulation. So you can see I'm registering event listener on a button. Here I'm reading the value from input and I'm appending new li, you know. So the actual logic, which in this case is nothing super complicated, but it's kind of get lost in this mess. So it's, for me, it's way more difficult to understand rather than this because you're just adding, yeah, it's just pushing new object into an array. And try to test this thing. Like testing this thing is way more complicated because you need to deal with dome which makes it slow and you need to s you need to prepare the dome then you need to tear down the dome and it's like yeah testing this controller is easier anyway let's let's do some more stuff um let's say let's say we want to uh be able to mark the task as done so i'm going to add an input uh checkbox and again, I'm going to bind this to item.done. OK? So again, the synchronization happens the same as with the other input. You can see if I refresh, the visit party is already checked because the model is true. Right? And whenever I click the checkbox, you can't see it at this point, but the model is being updated. So let me show that the model is really being updated. I have here CSS class done true, which basically sets the color to gray. And I'm, I want to apply this CSS class for the tasks that are already done, that are done true. So without the binding, you would have to basically intercept all the events that can lead to changing the model. In this case, it's just clicking the checkbox, nothing else. So not that much work. work. But then, later on, you might add some more features or something, and someone else can change the model from within your application. And you always have to think about, oh, and by the way, you need to update the CSS, right? So I, I really think that this declarative way uh, is easier for me, because I can just specify the relationship. I can go to this LI, and I say, you know what? Here's a CSS class, and it's done dash, and I use binding item done, right? 
and that's pretty much it. Because now you can see that visit party is gray. And if I un uncheck it, it's normal. You know, the, the CSS class is being applied. It's exactly what I wanted. OK, let me show you last thing with regards to binding. Look at this. It's kind of broken. Um, I think it would be good to, well, let's say, let's disable the button whenever, whenever the, if the input is empty, this input, if it's empty, disable the button. So now it should be disabled. If I press something, now it should get enabled. And if I remove the text, it should get disabled. So can you think, how would you implement this? Let's say with jQuery or whatever library you want to use. Come on, guys. I'm pretty sure you've already done that many times. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry, say again. You would go to the text box. Yep. And you would write something like NZ uh, on chains or something like this. So you are, you are uh, explaining how to do it with Angular. <laughs> Is that ah, correct? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you are already <laughs> thinking about no, Angular. No, I, I just tried to imagine. I mean, I would have done this with another library or, you know, just to the logic of catching the event. Yes. Uh, so, you would probably register event listener on the input to, to check the value whenever user types, right? Yeah, but with Angular you will do it something, you will need to assign something ng, ng and change or something like this? Yes. Well, I, I, I will show you. Okay. <laughs> but, but I wanted you guys to, to think about what, what would you have to do without this binding? Because you would have to register event listener on the input and basically, whenever user press key uh, on key down or something, check the value of the input. If it's empty or any other validation, disable the button. Again, you need the reference to the DOM element to the button. And if not, enable. You know, simple. It's it's not a big of deal. It's it would be like four or five lines of code, maybe even less. Not a problem. But I think this is really beauty of declarative programming. I'm not saying declarative programming is silver bullet for everything. It's not. But for this, these kind of things, I think it's really cool. Because do you know, you, I'm pretty sure you know uh, Microsoft Excel or any spreadsheet, uh, spreadsheet application, right? And in, my, in Excel, you don't say, if you change this cell, go there and change this cell. No, you just specify relationship. You specify like equation. Right? You say this cell equals A1 plus B2, and you're done, and you don't care. Like, you don't care how this happened, you just specify the relationship. And that's exactly what's happening here. Because you can go to the button, and you say, well, this button is disabled when uh, new text property is falsy, and you're done. Now you can see the button is disabled, and I can't add a new item. And whenever I press something, it gets enabled. And if I remove it, it's disabled back. So that's exactly the behavior we wanted, right? All right. What do you think about this, guys? Do you think this could be useful for you? Do you like it? Yes. Awesome. Uh, do you have any questions to data binding? Yep. Um, Microphone. Just oh, just curious on uh, why you opted for um, not the same kind of thick models that uh, Backbone uses, for example. It's kind of yep. Oh, so Angular is not that opinionated on the model. So the, the model in Angular is really like up to you. Pretty much very often people end up using just JavaScript objects. But if you are building something like, like big application, it's more like you want a proper model. So something like Backbone, but probably written by you. But yeah, Angular doesn't have this, this way of a, a like model. That's, there's no concept like that. But you can use anything pretty much. You could even use Backbone with that. If I had to, to bind the, um, the, the data from the server side, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, I don't know what way, 
but uh, what would you advise to the, the best way to combine with the, the, modi the modif uh, modifications in the server side and uh, to, to have them uh, like as soon as possible on the client side? Like to use some server push technologies like a WebSocket or server sent event and to... Okay, to so it, yeah. it depends. Be, uh, common use case of like loading like REST, loading data from server, I, I will show you in a second using Wakanda actually. Okay. And it's, Angular doesn't bind directly to server, right? You, you get the data from server and you have it in your client model and that's what you bind to. Okay. Uh, if you have something real time, you could definitely use Socket.io mm -hmm. or any other Socket implementation. And yeah, that's, there are examples on web how to use Angular with Socket.io. But again, you always do this uh, communication with the server, and then what you bind to is the model on the client. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about and I want to show you is dependency injection. You are, I guess you are more like you know, desktop developers on, or server side, so you might. Do you guys do Java? <coughs> so have you heard of uh, Juice? That's a, dependent, that's a really good dependency injection framework in Java. Cool. So in JavaScript, it's probably not that common, but it's coming. So wh what is dependency injection? Well, when you are building an application, especially when you are building a big application, you want to modularize your code, right? You want to split it into smaller pieces, and each of those pieces is responsible just for part of the functionality of the overall system. It's like building a car. You create, you have wheels, then you have crankshaft, engine, and seats, and, and then you need to assemble all these pieces together. And that's where, uh, that's where dependency injection comes handy. Because what dependency injection does, it, it separates the process of defining like, your logic and behavior from assembling the pieces together. And even more, it does the assembling for you so that you can focus on uh, implementing your behavior and logic. And the result of that is that your application became way easier to maintain. Because anything like adding new units, adding new services into your service, or refactoring, like taking uh, some big object and splitting it into two services, you know, or just, or just rewiring, restructuring the app, it's all very way easier with dependency injection. And again, because your app is more flexible, it's easier to test. And I, I, will, show you, I will show you why. So let's get back to our to-do app. And What we want to do is, I would like to do some persistence because you can see I have, I actually, um, I fast, forward, fast forwarded the app a little bit so you can see there's some more stuff implemented now but the whole example is on GitHub so you can check it out later if you want. But still, all the state is on client so I can archive, remove these things but now if I refresh, I have again the initial state because it is hard coded in my controller right here, okay? And so we want to use some persistent storage. And it's a Wakanda conference, so we are going to use Wakanda. Because uh, thanks to Alex, he actually implemented this integration. And it actually turned out that it's really simple to use Wakanda because it just works. So this is uh, Wakanda Studio. And pretty much the only thing you have to do is just define your model. So here is our. Here's our model, I'm not sh anyway, which is just IDE, uh, there's a text property, which is string, and there is done, boolean, you know, simple model. But the cool thing is that you just define this model, and on, based on this model, Wakanda will create the storage and the RESTful API. So if I go to slash REST item, you can see this is the response from the Wakanda backend, basically a list of some, uh, some tasks. And so what we are going to do, we are going to use this RESTful backend, the, the Wakanda backend, to, to get the data into client, 
and store them back to back to the storage, right? And the good thing is that it's JavaScript everywhere, so we can reuse actually this model on our inside our client application as well. So that's what we are going to do. This this web folder index that is basically the app that we've been so far editing. Here's our to do .js. There's a bunch of crappy files to show some other stuff, but this is the file that we've been editing. And I actually think that for the purpose of the talk, I will use this simple editor. Um, yeah. And I created a simple module for for Wakanda, basically that that knows how to talk to uh, this Wakanda backend. Basically, this Wakanda resource is a factory that no that creates a model that knows how to talk to Wakanda. So it knows um, what is the structure of the URL and which headers to set, and you know all all, ki all kinds of things like that. Basically, we define a couple of methods here, and that's pretty much it. So we're gonna we're gonna use this thing. So what we want to do is remove these hard-coded items and rather get them from the server, right? That's the first thing I want to do. And here's, here's the good thing, here's the great thing about dependency injection. Because with dependency injection, I can, just, I can just ask for, you know, I can say, I want a Wakanda, Wakanda resource. Well, actually, it's a separate module, so I need to add this dependency that we want to load this module. But I just say I want to work on the resource and I will get it. You know, I don't have to resolve these dependency. Dependency injection will take care of that. And here I just this is a factory that basically, you know, creates the model, so something like this. And then I will query this model to get the data, to get the items from server. Oops. Nope. And then let's let's make the add method work as well because now we would load the data from Wakanda and we want to store when adding we want to store the new items to to backend as well. So I'm going to replace this code with, you know, we create the instance of this model. Yeah, actually I need to refactor this a little bit, something like this. Okay, so this is model basically. That's like class in Java world. I'm gonna do new item, passing this data, and I'm gonna just push this item into my collection, and I'm gonna save it. And this will trigger XHR request to server to store it actually in Wakanda. Okay, let's see whether it works. Okay, that looks good. So you can see we already have different tasks, and if I refresh and show you network, um, there is this request. Let's make it a little bit smaller. And you can see we are getting these d data from the storage. So now we are already doing the first thing you were asking about, which is loading the data from Wakanda. <laughs> And when I add a new task, um, oops, I just closed. Sorry. You can see there is a post request sending the data to server. Right? So we are storing it in on the server as well. So now if I refresh, I still have the data because it's persistent in the backend storage. So that's cool. That's simple, it is. I mean, I think that is simple. But what I I want to show you the dependency injection. So let's let's imagine that our application has more controllers or something. Like in any reasonable application you would have more controllers. So let's define another controller. Let's say um menu for instance. Let's say you have menu somewhere and this menu controller will need the same model. Um, okay, we have 10 minutes. 
that's <laughs> let's say this controller requires the same model so you could do the same thing right you could sum equals that and maybe get some model with ID 13 or something and I want to show you how, how easy it is to, to refactor these things with dependency injection because now I'm basically d d creating the, the model twice for every controller. And that's, I don't like that. I would like to extract that into a separate service. Right? And with dependency injection, this is really simple because you can just define new service, like let's say um, factory item and return basically this thing. Right, and now I go to these controllers and say, well, this controller just needs item, and I can use this item here. And this controller, instead of asking for Wakanda resource, I'm just going to ask for item because that's already the model. I can remove this line, and you know, use the item directly. And this sort of refactoring is really easy because dependency injection takes care of this assembling part, right? So it's just, it's again, it's declarative. Every component of these things just declare what are its dependencies, and then dependency injection, when, when dependency injection is instantiating these controllers, for instance, this to-do controller, it looks, it looks into the constructor, because the another thing is the dependency injection makes the dependencies explicit and visible. So you look into the constru constructor and you see these are the dependencies. That's what I need in order to instantiate this controller. Uh, one second, which is which is really important for testing. And I, I unfortunately I don't have time to show you the testing. So you would have to find me afterwards or go to GitHub and check it out. I, I would like to uh, show you it, but I don't think we can we can do it in ter ten minutes. So, yeah, I, I kind of forgot what, what I was about to say, but the refactoring is simple because dependency injection takes care of assembling and makes dependencies explicit. Um, let's go back to... And that eventually make your app really flexible. Refactoring and all these things are, are easy. Question. Right. Okay. So I wanted to ask if I wanted to move one of those controllers and actually implement. Okay. Sorry. So if I wanted to take that controller, the second one you just implemented, and uh, mm -hmm. say add, expand it to like 500 lines of code, I would start thinking about, oh, I need another file. Mm -hmm. um, do I need to use require JS or something like that to get my other dependencies in, or? Okay. So dependency injection solves the assembling the app. Require JS is more about loading the files, mm -hmm. you know. So there's a lot of projects using uh, Require JS together with Angular. Mm -hmm. And yes, once once you get into there are other solutions than Require JS, but Require JS is definitely a good solution. There are some things that I don't like about it, mm -hmm. but uh, like there is no idle solution, yeah. so require JS is good. Yeah, I, I don't like it either, and uh, we actually figured that we don't need it because of um, dependency injection here, so it kind of solves the problem because... Okay, but I mean, you need to, you need to the solve the problem of loading the files, because otherwise you will end up that's, having that's, this index.html, and for right. developing you will still keep right. adding the files, and you don't want to do that. That's right. You want this to happen automatically. That's a good thing about require JS because mm -hmm. you don't have to do that. It, right, it directly mapped to the optimizer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, but yeah, require JS is one of the solutions. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let let me last thing last thing I want to talk about uh, is extensibility, because in Angular pretty much everything is really easy to extend. And I just, I was trying to show, with the dependency injection, I was trying to show that basically dependency injection make, uh, it makes your application easy, to, like flexible, easy to refactor and flexible. But what is cool that 
even the even Angular itself is wired together by, by the same dependency injection. So you can do the same things with Angular itself. So le let me give you an example of that. Like quick example could be, let's go to our add method and let's do, let's throw an error. So now if I add, oops, I need this. There is exception in the console, right? Nothing super exciting. But it turns out that there is, in Angular, there is something called uh, exception handler. And whenever there is an exception in Angular or your application, Angular always delegates the exception to exception handler. And exception handler can do whatever it wants with it. And the default implementation is just throw, in, throw it, you know, so that you can see it in console like that. But I can go to my code and I can easily define different versions, different implementation. So I can do, let's say, value different exception handler where I alert the error. The error. And now, where is it? I get alert. That's, it's probably not obvious, but if you think about it, we just changed the, the the behavior of the entire system, not just a piece of our app, but the whole Angular now behaves differently. And basically, Angular is composed with, from, by a lot of small pieces, and you can take any of those pieces and replace it with your stuff. Right? And the best thing, you remember ng click, ng repeat, ng disabled, and ng whatever, all these custom attributes, right? Because Angular, I mean, that's even on our homepage. HTML extended for web apps, basically extending the HTML vocabulary. So the cool thing is that you can actually, you can define your own, right? These ng repeats and stuff, that's just something default that we ship Angular with. But you have access to all the tools that we have, so you can define your own. So for instance, if you look into these slides, that's Angular, they're written in Angular as well. And if I show you the source code, oops. It looks something like this. You know, there is a deck, there, there is a slide, slide has a title, there is a step one, step two, you know. So for me, this is really nice because it's easy to write such a slide once you have this application, and it's really easy to read. Like, it's easy to understand what's going on here. And the end result's gonna be a lot of diffs in order to make, make it center and all these things, you know. But the point here is that there is no slide element in HTML. There is no slide element in Angular either. But that's because it doesn't make any sense to have one. But it does make sense to have slide element in my slides application, right? So at the end of the day, Angular is just a tool for you guys to define your DSL for your app that, that fits the requirements of your app. Um, all right. So, we skip it a little bit, but do you have any questions to this? Uh, is it possible to customize the resource URL uh, depending on the REST API uh, when uh, we create or update uh, a resource? Uh, for example, uh, the Wakanda API is different than uh, the Symfony API. The uh -huh. Well, it's not the same to access to the resource on the server. Yes. Okay. So there is, there is a low-level service service in Angular called dollar HTTP, and that's basically a service for sending XHRs to server. And we implemented the Wakanda resource on the top of that, like higher-level abstraction. So if you have different backend that doesn't fit this model, which is possible, like Rails is different and stuff, it's okay. You just have to write your own implementation on the top of this HTTP service. So that's, that's the solution. OK. So Angular is, tries to be end-to-end -end solution. So there's a lot of other stuff. Like I just showed you some basic features that I think that might, you might find useful. There's a lot of stuff like form validation, routing, uh, ha dealing with uh, hash bank URLs versus uh, normal regular URLs. 
If you think that it's interesting or if you like it, uh, you can go to the website. There is, there is a tutorial, and we are actually working now on just finishing a new tutorial, which is I really recommend you because you can basically in one or two hours, you can go through building f through the whole process of building simple app, and uh, it will show you how to write tasks and all these things. So I recommend you that. And the, the whole thing is uh, being developed on GitHub. It's entirely open source. So if you have any questions, go to mailing list. And the community is amazing. It's, I'm really impressed by the community. It's, it's really amazing. And last thing, it's a Google project. By the way, I've been told today that Google here in Paris, are, they are hiring for some cool HTML slash JavaScript projects. So if you are interested in that, let me know. And well, that means Google pays this project. So thank you, Google. And thank you, guys. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks for watching. And find me if you have questions.